This episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by the good-looking folks at GoDaddy.com. Use our code Linux and save yourself some cash. And welcome, welcome, welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 19, Episode 4. Recorded live November 6th for release later that day. It's a, a Sunday, November 6th. Live from an hour earlier Pacific Northwest. Well, an hour gained Pacific Northwest. My name is Chris, and joining me, like every week, is Alan. Hey, Alan. Hey, Chris. How are you? Hey, man. Welcome back to the show. we got a big show today. We do. We have one of the largest news segments we've had all week or i mean for a long time if you yeah. are new to the linux action show the way we do this here show is we've got a big topic in the second half of the show that we're going to dig into this week there's been a lot of mm, i don't know the term well respected doesn't seem to apply anymore but there's been things like there's been people in groups like the forrester research group and a lot of bloggers ZDNet out there always trying to get the clicks things like that people like that that have been releasing these claims this week that desktop linux is completely dead it's lost its chance it's not going to make it Call it, call it in, boys. Cash out your chips. You're, you're going to head home for the day. And I think it's time we tackle that topic on the Linux Action Show because so, this yeah. show is a very desktop-focused show. And I think if there's a show out there to take on this topic, it's this one. So we're going to tear into that this week. So that'll be later in the show. Before all of that, we've got a ton of news, including a look at the new Ubuntu. Lots of news came out of the Ubuntu Developer Summit. So we've got the goodies on what you're going to expect in the next version, as well as future versions of Fedora and... Did you know that Microsoft has donated some code to Samba? Yeah, GPL code. We'll talk about that, too. But before awesome. we get to all of that, let's say good morning to our good friends over at GoDaddy.com. Now, GoDaddy.com is the world's number one domain name registrar. And GoDaddy has recently extended their support of Jupiter Broadcasting to TechSnap. So now they're supporting two of our shows on the network, yes. which is awesome, right, Alan? For sure. Yeah. Now, for those of you who don't know, last week, last Friday, we're recording this on a Sunday, last Friday was my last day working. True statement. I'm a bum mm -hmm. now. I'm doing Jupiter Broadcasting full-time. I'm extremely, extremely excited. I'm, I'm hopeful for the future. I think we're going to mm -hmm. have tons of new shows. We've got three new shows in development right now. I'm not going to tell you about them because I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm just not going to do that. But we've got three new shows in development, tons of new energy. I'm planning to, over the next couple of weeks, get to a bunch of stuff that I've never been able to get to before because I've either been working or doing shows. Like I'm going to tear up parts of the, uh, of the studio live stream that and reorganize and rewire parts of the studio. And there is no question that this huge step would not have been possible without GoDaddy.com. So sure. by supporting GoDaddy and using our code Linux to check out and save 10% or Linux 20 to save on shared hosting plans, you are directly supporting my efforts and the network. And you're thanking someone like you're, you're thanking GoDaddy who's put a vote of confidence in Jupiter Broadcasting and has made all of this possible. Also, for a limited time, GoDaddy is offering Linux Action Show viewers a discount off the website Tonight Plans, where for a year you can get 15% off. And these things, actually, I'm not even sure if you have to do it for a year. I probably shouldn't say that. But use the code Linux12 by November 15th. So that's expiring soon if you're going to do one of these website yep. Tonight Plans. Linux12 will save you, uh, I guess it's, uh, yeah, 12 months or longer with 20% off. It ends on November 15th. If you want to build a quick site to show a client what you can do and how you can turn something around for them, this website builder tonight plans are the very best to do that. It's, it's yeah. an awesome way to slap something together and use that Linux exactly, 12 code because to save the, money. The, the idea behind the name website tonight is that you buy the website and there's a site on it tonight, right? It, it, it means you build the entire website in a couple of hours. Yeah, I know. It's great. It literally and, means grab your cup of coffee, click, 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 and build a site tonight. Uh, yeah, so and it's... You know, not a bad way to how, go. How many times do you buy a domain and then it sits there for a while because you never get around to finishing the site? Yeah, right? yeah. This it means you can get a site up right away. Yeah, and you know that's the first step to getting anywhere. I've actually anywhere. played with stuff like this too, like trying to automate WordPress rollouts and stuff like this. But this is way easier, so you yep. can check that out. But thanks to GoDaddy for sponsoring Linux Action Show and their new support for TechSnap, which is awesome. So use our code Linux to save ten percent, Linux twelve to save on one of those website tonight plans, and Linux twenty to save twenty percent off hosting plans. All right. Moving on, sir, I'd like to give you my runs Linux this week, Alan. Are you ready for yes, this one? Because it's kind of cool. nerdy. Yeah, I thought you might like this one. It is the world's smallest radio. It's called an SDR radio, which stands for, I got it right here, uh, software-defined radio, as in it's got a chip that's a multifunction chip that right. does different things based on what it's programmed to by the host operating system. Right, so it means it's one radio that can do a lot of different things, and you can you know, change what frequency it runs at using the software. 
This thing is so small. If you're looking at the video version of the show right now, I'm comparing the size of this box to a matchstick. Like, you know, the kind of things you light on fire. Uh, and this thing takes power. It takes an external GPS, and it takes an external send and receive antenna. So you, you, just because it's tiny doesn't mean you can't have a massively powerful antenna on this thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, you could do all kinds of things with thing. You can make this thing a Wi-Fi access point. You can make it a Bluetooth repeater. You can even hook it up over USB to a phone or, or to a computer. Uh, you would have to be a phone. They just have a picture of a phone here. And uh, Tether. It, 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 this thing is just so cool. And uh, yep. the actual motherboard itself is not much lar larger than a couple of quarters, you know, like American quarters. Yeah. So, uh, gosh, that's neat. And it, and, and it runs Linux. I just thought that was yeah. that's a great one. You know, uh, you know that I was going to come on here and say the world's smallest software-defined radio runs Linux. And that's just got to yes. be an, that's an obvious pick, right? Yeah. All right. But, yeah, it's just, you know, it has micro SD, USB, the set external ports for send and receive antennas because they don't necessarily have to be the same. Especially if you're doing a repeater, you might want the send uh, closer to the one side and the receive to the other side. Yeah, good points. Good points. It re reminds me a little bit of that Raspberry Pi computer, the Raspberry Pi that we talked about ages mm -hmm. and ages ago on the Linux Action Show. Also very small. Uh, thanks to yep. uh, Mr. Mango in the chat room for reminding me of that. All right. We've got an Android pick for you and a universal pick for you. And I like them both. Let's start with the Android <laughs> pick. It fits right in with what this show's doing these days, and that is Reddit is fun. It's a free app in the Android marketplace, and uh, of course, it's got 7,874 reviews and nearly all five stars, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It makes Reddit fun. It's a little app to let you browse the different subreddits and uh, tag what you like, vote up what you like, write from your phone, do some offline caching, and... You could stick uh, linuxactionshow.reddit.com in there and browse the Linux Action Show Reddit right from your phone. Get the coolest yep. Linux news and vote on what goes in the show right from our Reddit page, thanks to the uh, Reddit is Fun app. So a uh, link to that in the show notes. Look at, look at these reviews, Alan. 4.6 average review rating. I've, nice. I've been using this app for uh, forever, and I completely didn't even think to mention it in the show. I've done this a couple of times where I've had different apps, and I've been like, oh, I love this app. And I just totally space out that I've never mentioned it on the show. On the show, yeah. Well, uh, thanks to, uh, let's see, Jason John Wells in the uh, last subreddit reminded me this week. Yeah. He posted a link in our subreddit and said, uh, has anybody mentioned the Reddit is fun Android app? Duh. Duh. Well, we, uh, the, the last Reddit is kind of new, so it even makes sense now to yeah. help promote the last subreddit. Because, you know, that's where we get a lot of news from. And, and also, we don't always know what you guys are interested in learning about. And so, the voting, you... uh, honestly, Alan... Now, for the last two weeks, I've completely reversed my stance on a topic we were going to cover in the show because it was voted so positively on the uh, Reddit page. Mm -hmm. Like, I just, for me, my, I'm usually, I think I have pretty good instincts about what the audience wants to, to know about, and so I try to stick to that. But when you have the votes there, and, and the majority is so overwhelmingly voting one direction, it's like, okay, that's obvious. So then, you know what I've done both times? I've dug deeper into it and kind of gotten to the kernel of why people are interested in it, and they were right every time. So go yeah. check it out. It's... Uh, linuxactionshow.reddit.com, and you can vote away. All right. What do you say we move on to the universal pick? This is yep. an app pick that might run on BSD, might be a web app, or might be a Linux desktop application, or something completely different, a live CD. This week, we're going to recommend the System Rescue CD. You've probably heard of this one before, but you might not have tried it out. It is an awesome, small little ISO that you download, runs Linux, and comes packed full of awesome utilities to fix yep. Windows boxes, Linux boxes. Alan, have you ever had a chance to check this out? Uh, I've never actually used that one. Uh, it has Gparted. You've probably like, used the Gparted. No, oh, City, yes, right? I've used Gparted a uh, yeah. hundred times. Yep. This includes a small little GUI with Gparted on it. So along with all the other tools, yep. you can also use the very handy Gparted to resize partitions. It includes things like part image if you want to image your Linux box. I've had uh -huh. some issues with part image on Windows boxes, but you can make it work. It includes some command line uh, stuff. It, and it includes a web browser. Uh, I mean, uh, it, an antivirus scanner, an NTFS repair utility. So if you have a Windows box uh, that has yes. a screwed up file system, you can actually use System Rescue CD to repair it. It yep. also includes Clam AV. So if you have an infected Windows box, you can boot off the System Rescue CD and scan that Windows box with the Linux Live CD. And it's awesome if you have a Linux box that is not booting because you can get in, you can load this guy, boot off this. Mount your Linux file systems and make the repairs you need. Reboot. Yep. Bob's your uncle. Your system's running again. So that's System exactly. Rescue CD. And you know, I've I've used a, a commercial product like that before from uh, Sys Internals or Wintronics, something like that. Oh, sure. Uh, the Emergency Rescue Dish for Windows, yeah. and it allows you to attach to a window, but it, it costs a couple hundred dollars. Yeah. And 
<laughs> this this does almost everything you get there. It, it costs a couple hundred dollars, and it's updated like every five years. Like for every yeah. major Windows release, they finally fart out a new version to support whatever yeah. small changes because are made. It's in like CFS. it's like a uh, it's the Windows preboot environment or whatever, and it attaches to your Windows install, and you get something that kind of looks like a Windows desktop. Yeah, yeah. but it's ridiculously slow like you type a command in a command line it takes 10 seconds to find it on the cd before it starts yeah uh this system rescue cd can can actually run completely out of ram even if because it doesn't exactly. require much so if you don't if you do have a lot of ram in your box and you want a fast environment you can do a command where it'll, it'll load the entire thing into ram and then boot from ram and you've yep. never seen a fast system until you've ran an entire linux distro out of ram uh, yeah. system rescue cd also just had a new release that's the other thing that put them on my radar is they they just revved a new version and uh you can also, you know, you could write an image to a USB thumbstick if uh, you're if you're too cool for CDs. Yeah, be, and you know. you know that's also very handy. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, one last thing I want to plug before we jump into the news segment for the show is uh, the new Cybite. We have uh, Cybite is a science news show with Heather and myself, and it's a weekly show. It comes out Wednesday mornings over JupiterBroadcasting.com. I've mentioned it before on the show, but uh, I, you know, I know it's right up the Linux Action Show's audience. It's it's geeky news. And we take the approach with that show is everything that's like on TV these days and on the radio, so much of it is distraction. And while that's, there's some purpose to that, why not get some information, some entertainment with your distraction? So SciBite, we cover weekly news. We cover what's happened that week in, in the past for science discovery, stuff like that. And we cover what's going to be in the sky for that week. So if you're somebody yeah. who loves to watch the sky, tune into SciBite because we tell you what you're going to be looking forward to every single week. So you can find that over at jupiterbroadcasting.com as well. All right, Alan. Let's do the news. All right, Alan. That. Yeah. I'm all jived up this morning. Yep. I'm ready to go. We got a huge news dock. And news I wasn't kidding. Do. When I said earlier in the show, it's the, one of the biggest news dockets we've had in a while. It, it is. The Reddit yep. page is really paying dividends. It's, it's awesome. Yep. Um, let's start with probably the one that I think a lot of people out there We'll have some of the most interest in, and that is a Mark Shuttleworth's massive bombshell this week that Ubuntu is planning to refocus to smartphones and tablets, maybe even TVs. And this is really something. Now, we don't, I don't really think we should interpret this to mean that Ubuntu on the desktop is going uh, to fade away. I don't, I don't think that's what this think means so, at no. all. But uh, here's what Mark had to say, and I think this is kind of interesting. Now, this is an interview with ZDNet, but he said, Ubuntu 1204, the next, uh, it's going to be the next long-term support of uh, Ubuntu. They're, they're really going to make it as stable as possible and polish Unity as much as possible because their intention is, is to kind of make that like, okay, we're done here a little bit. We're not totally done, but we're kind of done, and we're going to refocus now on tablets. So their intention with 1204 is, is to make it as baked and finished as, of a product as possible so that way they can afford to give it less attention, I guess. Um, Canonical will be expanding its popular uh, Linux distributions with hardware manufacturers. He said that uh, they've been talking to partners for 18 months, the makers of, mm -hmm. uh, makers of smartphones and tablets. Uh, he also went on to say that uh, he expects a fully baked and ready for Ubuntu for all devices to appear in Ubuntu 14.04, which should be April 2014. So what they're talking about with the refocus to tablets and all that stuff is 2014. Um... That's a long ways out. I mean, yeah. when you, especially when you consider that Android and, and iPad are, uh, tablets are shipping today. Right, but... Windows 8 probably like next year, maybe. They have to wait for probably a little not. while to, for the hardware to catch up to be able yeah. to handle it. But also, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's a big change. Now, the, the, it'll be available before then. It just will, it'll be, you know, beta quality. Well, isn't that kind of the nice thing about having it be an open platform is if developers saw this and they thought, you know, I might want to run an Ubuntu-based tablet because it, it, it does. One thing it does offer is uh, it offers removal from getting log. It offers uh, you know prevention from being logged into the Microsoft and and Google ecosystems. And yep. what I mean by oh, that, that is, that's fine, yeah. you know, look at HTC now. They are kind of 100% married to Google. Yeah, they can make some Windows Phone devices, but they're not making any money off those. If they want to make a profit, they have to sell a good Android phone. Yeah. Well, what happens if Google does something silly like buys an Android phone manual? Oh, wait, they did that. Yeah, that's right. So what happens if Google starts making their own handset? Oh, wait, they're going to do that. That's right. So HTC could be looking at that going, crap, 
Yeah. Our our software provider is going to start competing with us directly. This is exactly what Mark Shuttleworth thinks that they're going to be able to play off. In fact, he even says yep. that they've had hardware OEMs uh, 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 come to them. He says, OEMs have tough choices. They can build their own operating system, such as what HP attempted to do with WebOS, or they can join consortiums, but he doesn't think consortiums like Mego will win. He says they can't take yep. a, they, you know, so they're really in a, in a tough spot, whereas Canonical, he said, and he actually said this, Canonical's in a position to offer them good deals to get their business. Canonical's yeah. in a position to give them good rev share deals, and yep. Canonical could look like the little, uh, little island of salvation for some of these guys who start getting more and more locked in. Well, because there's a couple of things there, right? If, you, if you're a smaller handset manufacturer, even trying to compete against Samsung and uh, HTC on, in the Android it's like, well, they're getting direct help from, from Google on various things, and I'm not. So I, I can't really compete in the Android marketplace with Google and its own handsets and the major other manufacturers. That's what I'm thinking, yeah. So if I want to set myself apart, maybe this Linux, and the Linux one is you know, cheaper, and you know, we've seen companies paying, you know, Microsoft makes as much money off Android as anybody else with all their silly patent problems. Yeah. And so... Well, and the question becomes, uh, will Canonical be ready to defend itself against the onslaught of patent attacks that they're, no, they're undoubtedly going to face from Microsoft if they develop a successful product? Yeah. Is Canonical fortified enough? Does Canonical have the partnerships to, to, to license the patents that they might need in order to defend themselves? Because we've just seen Microsoft and Apple go like attack dogs after people. And uh, Microsoft's even going after the makers of Chrome OS Netbooks and other Linux-based... In fact, if you recall, one of the very first companies... Microsoft struck a deal with was Amazon for their use of Linux on the Kindle. Before yep. Android was really shipped, all that stuff, they already scored a deal with a vendor for their use of Linux. My guess is that's why the Fire, the Kindle Fire, is going to be protected. Uh, yep. A Canonical, this will be a problem I believe Canonical has to defend itself against. Now, yep. this is sort of stealing some thunder from the second half of the show, an argument I'm going to make, but I, I think 2014 might not be too late. If you look at the Microsoft strategy, the Microsoft strategy is waiting for their OS to develop and they're waiting for the hardware to develop. There's going to be a whole other cycle of products at the, in 2014. You know, there's, there, there, just because the iPad is winning now doesn't mean the iPad's going to win in 2014. The iPad wasn't winning in 2009. You know, some, you know yep. so there's, it, it's, these market things, people have a tendency to see what's dominating the market right now and just assume that's how it's going to be forever. And, and give up the disrupt and, and forget about the disruptive nature of technology. Um, so I don't think 2014 is too far out. They, no. they, if they're lucky, there'll be another product cycle there. But they could be facing a different game here now with app store lock-ins and music store lock-ins and music services that are all video services that are all tied. So it'll be interesting yeah, to watch. So that, that'll be the interesting thing because, you know, while people will always be looking for an alternative to their iDevice or whatever, especially if it can compete on price. Uh, at some point, you know, if you have all these Android things and you've bought into all these apps and especially if, you know, if you buy an app once and it works on your phone and your tablet. Right. And things like that. And, and you know, if you're bought into the iTunes music store or whatever, and that's not available on your Android device, then you're probably going to stick with the iDevices just because of that inventory. Well, and now so, remember though, I mean, it's not fully matured yet, but Canonical right. is, uh, is also on the back end developing Ubuntu One with the music store. Right. Uh, there's and no so, reason they couldn't de deliver video through that. And with their Unity platform, I can't believe I'm calling it that, but with their Unity air quotes platform, they can invest in one desktop technology, sort yep. of like what Microsoft's trying to do with the Metro UI, right? But mm -hmm. uh, I think a superior approach, and uh, they might be able to offer a more scaled down version of what Google and Apple are offering now. And we'll never, we, you know, we won't know until, the, until it arrives, but... Yep. I'm kind of curious to watch it happen. Uh, something else. But the oh, the other interesting thing is the fact that they're using the long-term support version, specifically meaning that you know it'll offer stability. Where right now, especially with uh, like Android, we see these you know versions popping up all the time and updates and long-term support just yeah. means uh, that it's a more stable platform, especially if you're trying to develop apps, right? Like uh, people in the chat room were saying, you know, every time they develop an Android app, the next version of the OS or different hardware comes out, and everything's all different. Right, Linux is a little better at abstracting that, so that you know different hardware isn't going to affect the app as much. Wow, that is a great point. In fact, wouldn't that sort of address what I was getting all hot and bothered about last episode, where I was all pissy that the Nexus One has already been removed from support for Ice Cream Sandwich? Right. Uh, you know, if it's something that's based on Ubuntu, first of all, some of those issues that Android has is just the result of it being such a young platform. Yeah. Where Ubuntu doesn't have that issue. Even right. though it's on a new hardware device, it's still based on an established platform. 
uh, exactly. that could be its number one feature for a guy like me, honestly. Yeah, Great point. and just the fact that it's because it's community powered, it'll never go away either. Right. It's not one vendor is going to get fancy and decide to move on to something else completely and just say, F it, I, I don't care anymore. Right, and, Great point. and you're not going to be stuck with a phone with an unsupported OS or whatever. Well, I, exactly, exactly. And I, I think this hardware that Ubuntu is going to support has got to be more general purpose, so perhaps we're getting to the point where some of this tablet-based hardware will, will be more user, user serviceable, at least in terms of the operating system. Possibly, uh, yeah. If anything, if anything, if anything, if Canonical and Ubuntu making this software available for tablets encourages hardware manufacturers to make it possible for users to load their own operating systems, even if it's just like where they ship it with like a free DOS type thing, you know, which they won't, but something like that, that would be a huge win for consumers. Yep. Even if it's not a, net, a direct win for Canonical, it, 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 is, it would be huge for us in the future. So, All right, well, let's talk about something else Ubuntu is, has, has coming up. This came out of the Ubuntu Developers, uh, um, what a, UDS, Ubuntu Developers Summit. And uh, it's uh, a little information about a version 1204. According to various sources, the ISO image size for the upcoming long-term support of Ubuntu will not fit on a regular CD anymore. Dun, dun, dun. Yes, the weirdest part, though, is that it will be 750 megabytes. It's like, either just trim 50 megabytes of fat <laughs> or go full out and fill a DVD. I know, right? And the funny, the funny thing about that is they're actually, another story out of UDS, is uh, they're actually replacing uh, Banshee with Rhythmbox and pulling out Mono. Yeah. So they're actually going to say, remember, okay, so Fedora claimed they wouldn't ship Mono because it didn't fit on the disk. Now Ubuntu is pulling out Mono, Mono and Banshee and still has to have a larger CD. So uh, yeah. <laughs> that's kind of funny. I don't know. Uh, this back and forth between Rhythm and Banshee, I'm just giving up. I'm giving up on Mono in general, really. Uh, it's... It seems to be a, a losing battle. All right. And uh, one last story about Ubuntu 1204 that came out of UDS is uh, Ubuntu 1204 will finally recommend you go 64-bit. Yeah. I don't see any problem with that. Uh, no, it's just... Right. And before, the reason was, you know, there was problems with Flash and yeah. so on and so on. And yeah. now, most of that's resolved. 64-bit is a mature platform now. Right. Right. right? All right. I, I kind of avoided it at first, too. But also now, most... Uh, like, when I'm dealing with servers and stuff none of them have less than four keybinds of RAM. that's that's the that's for me the biggest thing that pushed yeah. 64 bit adoption ahead was i just started using more than four gigs now i will commonly like the uh isos that are the uh the arch arch geez the virtual box images that yep. we put out for the show i often will do those to 32 bit because i don't i still yeah. feel like a lot of people out there are using 32 bit and if i don't or use more than four they, gigs like, of ram they have machines that even if they're 64 bit they don't support 64 bit virtualization Right, because right. uh, the cheaper Intel and AMD chips don't include the vir uh, hardware-assisted virtualization. Yeah. And without that, you can only do 32-bit virtual machines. Quite a bit of people in the, uh, in the chat room still say they're using 32-bit. So Yeah, yes. and uh, so that, that's the thing with the, the bigger CDs now and the, you know, kind of moving towards 64-bit. As well, it's, you know, everybody wants the progress. You don't want to leave out, you know, one of Linux's major markets is the machines that are slightly behind the curve. and you know, 32 bit machines with, you know, limited disk space and limited thing. And well, maybe you know, they don't have 32 bit. They'll still have right, it as an option. Right. But uh, at this point, they're going to be not having a CD as an option. Yeah. True. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it, it seems to me that you could, you know, cut something from the install uh, to make it fit on a CD. True. I agree with you there. I, I do agree with you there. Well, what do you say we shift gears and talk a little bit about Fedora? You ready to do that? Yeah. Now, this isn't uh, for the next release of Fedora, which we will be reviewing next episode of the Linux Action right. Show. The release of Fedora is kind of off schedule for the big show because I, I want to do the review based on the final code. The betas are good for getting an early impression, but just like it bit me in the Ubuntu review, some uh, small things change. So I have to wait to review. Even in Ubuntu, I waited to review the final version. I spent a lot of time in the beta, so a couple of my impressions were wrong based on the beta. So Fedora's review will be in the next episode of the Linux Action Show. Um, let's talk about Fedora, what might be coming to Fedora 17, though, and that is, get ready for this, moving all binaries to slash user slash bin. Uh, the Fedora project developers are proposing to move all executables, files, and libraries used in the slash user directory from, for, from, for, um, from for Fedora 17 onwards, and essentially getting rid of slash bin, slash lib, slash lib64, and slash sbin. Right. Um, Fedora 17 would be in May 2012, so the world might not even make it long enough for these changes to be made. 
Uh, as part of the proposal, the distinction between slash bin and slash s bin and between slash user slash bin and slash user slash s bin would be dissolved and executable files would be stored in slash user slash bin. Ah, uh, so the separating out the system utilities as well, or exactly. unseparating them. Unseparating, which some people are crying wolf because they say, well, wait a minute, my security permissions are based on that. Uh, you know, I, I expect things to be in a certain spot, so I have the security rights set that way, especially for the S bin folder. Yep. But uh, the, Fedora's response is, well, that's just kind of security through obscurity, and that's not really the way to secure your box. Right. Yeah. This, the interesting thing about this proposal is, and I, I apologize, uh, I'm going to, Lenart Pottering, I think, perhaps, might be how you yeah. pronounce his name. Uh, I apologize. I know I'm so horrible with the pronunciation. Let's just say it's a sh let's just pretend like it's a thing I do on the show for fun, and we won't pretend like I'm actually a retard. Uh, Leonard Pottering is uh, best known for his work with Pulse Audio and System D. He was the champion and I believe the originator of Pulse Audio and System D, uh, the replacement for the system via Nit Daemon. Also, he did work, and I don't know how much, but he did work on Avahi Zero Comp, which I'm actually a pretty big fan of. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, on Reddit, some people were concerned, oh, the Pulse Audio guy is recommending this. Well, no wonder it's a crackpot idea. <laughs> I actually don't think it's that bad of an idea. And I actually, Not think, and I actually think this is the right guy to do it, too. So I, I, follow, I looked up on him, and yeah, you know, complaints can be made. Oops. Complaints can be made about Pulse Audio. I was one of them. Primarily, Pulse Audio shipped too soon. But that's water under the bridge at this point. And this guy's passionate. This guy really believes in stuff, and he's really driving stuff through for Fedora. And he may, he may really be on to something here. Not only that, Alan, but it, it, lets, you, it lets you play a little bit more with like, um, isolating stuff onto their own partition. So you could, you could mount that as, uh, so you slash user slash bin maybe could be read-only. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of security benefits you could get. You could make, that could make deployment for a bunch of virtualized servers a lot easier because you just set it up once and snapshot that slash user slash bin and just deploy it on every server. I mean, yep. there's a lot of advantages. They're thinking of long term. Will Red Hat Enterprise adopt this? Because you know it's based on Fedora. I, right. I, I doubt it. What do you think, Alan? Would you like to see something like well, this? Well, if on? if it became you know uh, a thing about virtualization, it may actually move towards that. But um, there are advantages and disadvantages to doing it that way. Uh, and like you specifically mentioned about the partitions, and you know in FreeBSD we have a hierarchy that you know is based on that slash bin versus slash usr slash bin yes and that is actually right there is about the partitions uh right you have your your root partition slash that has slash bin and slash s bin and slash lib and so on and those are tools that are required in single user mode right so it's your commands like mount uh and fsck and okay. all the basic stuff right mm -hmm. and then usr bin is your multi-user mode stuff like that's where you find like if config and and you your editors and add user commands and so on and the reason for this is because slash USR is usually a separate partition in BSD anyway. And I think that's uh, what Fedora is talking about here. Right. And, and so the idea is that when you boot in single user mode, it only mounts the root partition mm -hmm. and not slash USR. Because uh, under BSD, slash USR is also where your home directory is. So typically, slash USR is like the rest of your hard drive. Uh, it's really big partition. So it takes a long time to, to fisk it. So oh. by having your a small like by default 250 or 500 megabyte root partition that contains just you know this rescue system basically, right? It has your etc config files and your basic utilities to start the system and manage it. Right. Uh, when you boot into single user mode, it has you have only those utilities. That seems and pretty clean and efficient. That and way, if that way, if your slash usr partition won't mount, you have a set of tools to fix it. Yeah. Now, if you put all those yeah. tools in slash usr slash bin. And you can't mount the partition that that's in, then you have a problem. Yeah. Now, are, are you familiar with uh, Gobo Linux? No. Gobo Linux is kind of famous. It's been around since like I don't know. Like I don't. I want to almost say like '94. I mean, it's been around for almost ever. But it's really famous for having a very customized Linux folder hierarchy. Like I'll give you. Mm -hmm. I, I took. A, I jotted a couple of examples down in the show notes. Um, <clears throat> in Gobo Linux slash bin slash s bin and slash user bin and slash user slash s bin are all sim links they're not they're not real directories in gobo linux right. they point to they they throw everything under under like a slash system hierarchy so they have a much more like os 10 like yeah uh, file uh, that's system the first layout. thing i noticed was a because the folder names have capital letters in them yeah that, yeah. that makes me reminds me of os 10 right there yeah yeah <laughs> so it's not unusual for a linux distro and in fact these guys say you know 
having this stuff sim linked and stuff like that hasn't broken really anything. And I think Fedora would have a, a similar approach. They would use sim links for compatibility purposes. And, well, and uh, when they control all their packages, it's not as big of a deal to do that. True. True. Yeah. They have and a pretty I, good proposal that I've, I've linked to the yep. show notes too. If people want to read on that. But what were we gonna say? Yeah, and I linked to the uh, the. FreeBSD directory hierarchy, which is explained in detail, but the yeah. biggest difference with BSD is that everything that comes from a package gets installed under slash USR slash local, right? We talked about this a little bit before. Uh, like even when it makes a config file, that doesn't go to slash etc. Right. It goes to user local etc. Right. And, right, and all the binaries go user local bin or user local s bin and so on. And so uh, again, that comes back to this idea you had of keeping the OS and the packages separate uh, with, for like snapshotting or whatever. Yeah, that's right? what they're talking about too. Is that you can your slash USR if you make user local a separate partition, then everything else in USR is static, right? It's the operating system. And so you can snapshot that. Or uh like we talked about a little bit with the backup thing, is Bacula can do these what are called base backups, where I have thirty five FreeBSD machines. If they're all the same version, I can do one base backup that includes all of USR except for user local and user home. And those will be, it'll be the same, and I'll deduplicate that out of every backup. Right. So I only back up the OS once instead of 35 times, and <laughs> right. then on each of those machines, only files that are different are backed up individually. Right. I think, machine. you know, I, I, Alan, you're touching on exactly, I think, what uh, some of their, philo their philosophy behind this decision is. If this yeah. happens, it would be in Fedora 17, mm -hmm. um, pre a pretty massive change, and I think we, I'd be pretty surprised to see that trickle down to Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Yeah, I, I think I, I'd be surprised to see a change like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. At least if it happened, it would definitely be the next major version of Red Hat. Oh yeah, and that'll be a while away anyway. Right? Yeah, they don't yeah. do a major version very often because they're more about, uh, on port. Let's talk about Fedora 16 though, because that's much closer. In fact, that'll come it out is. on November 8th. We're recording this on November 6th, which means, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the last review will be the, in the next, ep the next episode of Linux Action Show. We'll have a review of Fedora 16. It's got the GNOME 3 going on there, so I'm kind of curious mm -hmm. to see what they've done with that. And uh, we'll give you the, our full takes on that. Now, let's talk about the Linux Mint 12 preview, because in my opinion, this is one of the biggest wave setters in the desktop Linux space this week. The GNOME uh, Linux Mint project has been working, trying to figure out, should we go GNOME 2 with Linux Mint 12, or is it time to bite the bullet and go GNOME 3? After a l much deliberation, they've decided they're going to go GNOME 3, and they're introducing something called, they're introducing something called MGSE, and if my, if my understanding is correctly, this is actually li uh, the Linux Mint project's making. And uh, they're trying to make GNOME 3 a more usable experience with more traditional menu and more GNOME 2-like experience, actually. GNOME 3 with all the things you like about GNOME 2, essentially. And um, hmm. they're calling it a mix of new and old. There's a few screenshots in this article. I got to say, I have to say, um, really looking good. Really looking good. But something that kind of interesting happened. Linux Mint went on to mention that they consider themselves to be the fourth largest, dis uh, largest operating system in the world, <laughs> which is pretty substantial. Uh, and they're also uh, a bunch of people in the chat room are saying they noticed that Mint is number one on DistroWatch now. This week it hit number one on DistroWatch yet. So here's what they say. Linux Mint is the fourth most, most popular desktop OS in the world with millions of users and probably outgoing, outgrowing Ubuntu this year. The revenue that Mint users generate when they see and click on ads within search engines is quite significant. So far, this revenue is entirely gone towards the search engines and browsers. Our goal is to give users good search experience while funding ourselves by receiving a share of this income. Here's the ballsy part. Search engines who do not share income generated by our users are removed from Linux Mint and may get their ads blocked. Whoa, huh? That's a pretty... I guess if you have millions of users, that ad revenue can be pretty significant. Um, yep. They say we're trying to make it so it's not down to just sponsorships anymore and donations, but just your your general activity on the web and web searches will help fuel uh, Linux Mint development. They hope to have uh, the first yep. RC done by November 11th. So, boy, right after Mint 11. Or, I mean, right after, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Fedora 16. Yep. The other thing that I thought was really interesting, they're also trying to they're also trying to make Mate work. Now, if you guys remember Mate, we covered on the Linux Action Show weeks ago. It is a fork of GNOME 2.32. It looks and behaves exactly like GNOME 2, and they're trying to make it also work in GNOME 3. It creates a lot of problems though because uh, GNOME 2 doesn't work next to GNOME 3. So, along right. with path changes and compatibility changes, there's some there gonna there might be some rough edges. So they're saying it may or may not make it. 
And if it does make it, it might be a little rough around the edges. They also say they're working on a fallback mode since GNOME 3 requires video acceleration and they realize that's something most systems don't have. So Linux 12 will also make sure that you can uh, uh, go into what's going to be called a fallback mode. It might not look amazing, but it's sort of due to limitations in GNOME 3. But if nothing right. else, they should be able to have a, you should be able to have a good working experience with GNOME 3 inside VirtualBox. Because that's something we commented about uh, Ubuntu having, right? With the Unity, the fallback was didn't actually look bad. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It, it, it's, you could almost not tell the difference except for, you know, 3D in a couple of places or whatever. The one thing that they talk about GNOME, and I'll, 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 this will be the last bit I cover on this, is they say GNOME 3 is changing all, is changing and all and getting developed for the better. Uh, they're creating better ways for us to interact with our computer. From our point of view here at Linux Mint, we're not sure if they're right and we're not sure they're wrong. So we're going mm -hmm. to let you use, we're, we're, so they say we're going to take GNOME 3 but we need to let you interact with the computer the way you expect it, the traditional way and the new way. So the, they say their argument is GNOME 3 is great, but it changed too much about the basic paradigm of computing. It was too application-centric and not task-centric. And they right. want to bring that back and make GNOME 3 more of a traditional desktop. That could right, be a one-two combo that could really set them at the top of the desktop Linux pile. Right, because uh, especially even with Unity, it's, it's like it kind of gives you that interface that you get from your phone or tablet where you can do one thing at a time. It's like, yeah. well, on computers, we've been multitasking for, you know, <laughs> quite a long time now. Yeah. And, you know, how often do you need things side by side? And, you know, it, again, it's about tasks, not apps. Right. So, um, I'm, I'm, you know, my main desktop Linux of choice is Linux Mint. I, I think as a Linux Mint user, I am so excited about them going this direction because I, obviously I do this show and I'm really interested in the cutting edge of Linux and open source. So it kind of kills me not to use GNOME 3 in a way because I know it's the latest offering that Linux has. So I sit here and I feel like I'm constantly in it, like at an internal battle when I'm using older versions of a desktop because I know something newer is out there that I just need to learn and adapt to because that's just the way it's going to be and better just get used to it. So, but I don't like it. I, I just, I, I'm not as efficient in it. And it takes forever to yeah. do some certain things. So the fact that they could be answering this problem for me, oh man, am I excited. I'm really Yeah, excited. well, because, uh, you know, I hate when they change stuff on me. It's just like, for just change. leave my stuff alone. I was working perfectly fine. And, and there's some logic to it. It's not just resistant to change. I want to embrace change, but I want to embrace good change. Yeah, and, you know, gradual is better. It's hard to completely change your paradigm overnight right right and perhaps the paradigm was changed too much yeah well it's this problem i've had even with you know windows and stuff it was like i tried windows 7 for a little bit and it was like no i'm going back to xp because i just can't work as fast yeah yeah uh all right let's move on next story in the news doc it's kind of an interesting one it's for uh, portugal Portugal schools yes. are switching to open source. In light of a massive national budget cut, uh, mm -hmm. the Portuguese government will force public schools to move to free and open source software. Now, we've got a Google translation uh, if you want to read the full thing, but the Slashdart article goes on to say, uh, their schools with some 50,000 outdated computers won't see their software licenses renewed. The main reason is cost of hardware upgrade mm -hmm. and the software update licenses, which would mostly go to Microsoft. The Slashdot article goes on to ask, will the Euro debt crisis be driving and forcing more open source software adoption? Possibly, but again, it comes down to, it's not just the cost of the licenses, right? Like, if the whole IHT department infrastructure of the school board doesn't know anything about Unix or Linux, it's not like they're going to be able to switch all the machines over and have it work. Right. Now, the one thing, though, that I found kind of interesting is Microsoft rolled into Portugal, <laughs> just rolled in there like the big grill they are, and said, mm -hmm. Here, you buy our licenses at this discounted rate, <laughs> and we'll offer you free training and free books and get you rolling. And they did. Microsoft did that stuff, and they gave them a great <laughs> software discount. They gave them great training. They sent out a team of specialists out there to help people deploy the different software packages that they had bought. But guess what? Their, their, their software is up for renewal. And guess what else happened? That awesome deal that they were going to strike is gone. That first deal? No. Yep. Now you've got to pay the full price. Now you've got to right. pay up. That's Microsoft's whole thing is to, is to hook you and then, and then you're screwed. But the other thing is, again, that, right, they have older hardware and they can't afford to upgrade the hardware. Right. Well, Microsoft won't run the newer OS anyway. And Microsoft's so, yeah. whole approach with that, with that tactic is assuming that good times are ahead and that they'll be able to afford the higher cost and buy more. But yeah. the problem is, is the bubble bursts well, also, it and costs people are more, out of money. 
it costs more to change from one system to another than, right? Sure. Like, it costs more to switch than it does to, to pay the licenses and, and keep paying for the more expensive solution. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's true. So, you know, if Linux can get in there before Microsoft does sometimes, then it's better. If Linux can save them on hardware costs and software licensing costs, I think it's going to be a slam dunk. Uh, right. And once they're in there, uh, they're more likely to get to stay. Oh, yeah. Good point. Yeah. Uh, all right. So Microsoft, though, isn't totally anti-open source these days. Boy, times, they are a change in, Alan. Uh, Samba. Oh, I, there's oh. more to this than... Oh, than you want to go on? Okay. No, go take it. Well, no, no. I mean, uh, Samba, sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, so Microsoft has committed some uh, developer code, some GPL code, GPL3. What? Uh, to the Samba, uh, Samba project on October 10th of this last um, month. Microsoft de- a Microsoft developer contributed a GPL license patch to the Samba project. The patch was part of proof of concept for extended protection of NTLM. That's the uh, Microsoft NTLM protocol. Uh, yeah. In 1993, and this isn't totally uncommon for Samba, though, because in 1993, uh, some Microsoft, a Microsoft employee added some, a debug statement to SMB Create. And, of course, some of you might remember back in 2007, the EU, uh, a judgment from the EU commission required that Microsoft publish protocols for the Samba document, for the Samba project. Exactly. Uh, so part of this, I think, is, is Microsoft relies on the devices people buy, like set-top boxes, like a Roku or whatever, to be able to connect over SMB and access the files on their Windows network. Ah, yeah, sure. Right? So all this those is all about built-in just, like, entertainment boxes and stuff. Yeah, run and just all the things. Like, so they want those to work uh, with the newer authentication mechanisms and so on. So they contribute code to Samba because they know that Samba code will be used to power embedded devices all over the place that need to be able to access their Windows machine, right? Because, like, Sam was yep. even used on, like, uh, I'm pretty sure it's used on the PlayStation for the ability oh, to sure. browse to your computer. And it's used uh, by tons and tons and tons and tons of routers that have that USB port in the back that you can uh, plug a USB yeah. hard drive into and it turns into a file share. That's, that's yeah. Samba. You know, that's yeah. all that mm-hmm. is. So, yeah, that's an excellent point, Alan. Uh, so H- it's, it's more about compatibility and letting Microsoft remain as a standard. But so I think you're saying they're not being a nice guy here. But I think part of it's the being forced by the lawsuit, and part of it is just <laughs> they're getting something out of it too, right? They're not yeah. just doing it because they yeah. want to. Times have changed, though. H Online contacted the Samba Project, and they had this to say: uh, "You know, most people didn't even notice the source of the contribution. That's how far things have come in the past four-ish years." He says, "A few years ago, a patch submission from Microsoft coders would have been amazing to the point of unthinkable, but times have changed. In fact, I mean, yeah. this was this code was contributed on October 10th, and we're just now reporting on it on November 6th." Because it just kind of went unnoticed. It just wasn't a big deal. The Microsoft submitted GPL code. Well, Microsoft submitted code to something else we covered a couple weeks yeah. ago too, wasn't yeah. it? I can't remember what it is now, but it still it still blows my mind, Alan. It's just it's just I've, five years ago, six years, six years. I guess we're coming on six years ago when we started the mm-hmm. Linux Action Show. That just pfft, no, never would have happened. Well, basically now they're part of it is that they've realized that they're less that Linux is less of a threat and more that interoperability means that people will use both. Yeah, yeah. Or they've, they've accepted the pat- fact that people are going to use uh, have a mixed environment and that they might as well just make it work. True, true. Or they, uh, they agree with some of the people that we're going to talk about in the next segment and that the Linux desktop is dead. So they just say, oh, whatever. But we'll, uh, we'll, we'll debate that in the next segment. Yes. Let's talk about ArchBang because we gave a real minor plug for it in our Shaka Raka review uh, last week or the week before. Uh, but ArchBang is, is, an, is a true to, true to honest to goodness Arch based distribution, but uh, with a more minimal desktop, as you can see here in the screenshots. And they've just released a new version. Their November release is out. And uh, congrats to these guys. ArchBang looks like a desktop Linux that I just have not given enough time to. It looks nice and sleek, fast. And of course, I love Arch. So uh, yeah, Chatroom's also giving it love there. So go check out the latest ArchBang. It's a good looking SOB. And uh, it was just released. New, uh, new version for download. So if you've been tempted to get involved with Arch, and our Shaka Raka 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 review kind of got you peaked, your interest peaked, but you wanted something that's more pure Arch, I think ArchBang has is, is got to be the way to go. Yeah. So go check that out. All right. The last story. Unless, did I miss anything? Nope. Dude, well, man. We're chugging. Yeah. We're chugging right yeah. along. All right. The last story on the news docket for this week is sort of something to look out for in the future. Every now and then at the end of the news docket, I like to throw one of these in here is to say, hey, in a while you're going to be seeing this. And when it hits, it's going to be awesome. I love covering stuff first on Linux Action Show. Yep. And this was submitted to the Reddit subpage. I'm, I'm blanking on the uh, username who submitted it. I'll, let me see if I can dig it up. Uh, but the, the Tiki Suite, right? Is that Tiki? Tiki? You know, like Tiki Wiki? Yeah. Yeah. These guys are getting together what might just work out to be one of the largest 
open source efforts I've seen in a very long time. The Tiki Suite, get ready for this. It's going to be a free and open source collaboration. Ready for this one. Office productivity, publishing software, featuring a wiki, CMS, groupware, e-commerce, account management, document management, CRM, web conferencing, desktop sharing, a PBX VoIP telephony technology, IM and presence, video management, e-learning, all on top of the, all called the Tiki Wiki Suite or whatever they're going to name it. Um, And obviously some wiki functionality in there, but they expect this thing to be a multi-server deployment, but you'll drop it into a small business and they'll just get all of those things. It's like the... And it's integrating uh, web and desktop stuff. Yes. I I just I and, think this is an awesome effort. It's yeah, it's and not it also just an answer with, to Microsoft Small Business because you know Microsoft yep. Small Business comes with AD and Exchange and SharePoint, but it takes yep. it a whole another step forward with the PBX solution and the yep. web conference conferencing and all that stuff and desktop sharing and so on. Yeah, yeah, and so, it also fits really well with our next topic too. It does. You're right. You're right about that. So this this like you know nothing's shipping yet, and it's going to be a pretty high end implementation. But uh, God, talk well, about, it, there's going to be some issues with getting that many separate projects to work yes. together. Yeah, because they're right. talking about you know working with the uh, LibreOffice, working with the Firefox project, working with you know um, w- uh, different uh, different analytics projects out there, working with different tele- telephony right. projects. It's, it's yeah, a lot of different like stuff. Like OpenOffice and Firefox are easier to work with than a lot of these smaller projects. I think. Yeah, maybe are, n- maybe not quite as as you know organized in the same kind of, you know, structured command decision type system. True, they don't have like a they don't have like a process in place to take on this kind of stuff. Right. Like a like a representative whose job it is to interact with other projects out there like some of these larger projects have. But, right. you know, uh talk about a respectable effort. This is truly yes. like a, a Linux open source small business solution that yep. eventually I I would think guys like myself who have been contractors have had to go in and and pitch a, an all-encompassing solution to a company, this is going to be high on the list, especially when you talk about... Well, yeah, because you know, until now, your choice was, well, I'll set up and manage these 10 different yes. discrete services, and right. that'll be a giant pain in the ball. Right. Or you can pay the ridiculous fee for Microsoft Small Business. And a lot of these, a lot of them, when you do them independently, like different cloud-based services, have a monthly fee associated with them that you have to sign up yeah. for each one. So and it adds up really quickly. Them. And Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pretty cool. All right. Well, anything else in the news doc before we move on, Ellen? No, I think we're ready for the big topic. All right. We're going to jump into the big topic now. This week, uh, we're going to take on the challenge. Is uh, desktop Linux really dead? Well, we're going to answer that question in the next segment. All right, Alan. Let's Mm -hmm. take on this topic. I kind of feel like it's been the elephant in the room for the Linux Action Show for a few weeks. It's been bubbling. It all kind of started about Two, three months ago, I think, I think that was about the time frame, when iOS officially surpassed Linux on the web for uh, web browser usage. Well, and again, those are statistics that are collected not necessarily representatively. Right. right? If, they're, if they're targeting social media websites or whatever, it's like a lot of Linux users tend to avoid those. Yeah, and- I, but I think, that, I think that news story was like the kernel, the seed in people's minds that got this topic started. I tried to yep. trace it back to when this, where, all the, where all the murmurs started. Mm-hmm. But what in the last week, gas was really thrown on the, fu- uh, on the fire. The flames just got out of control when uh, Forrester research analyst, Mike Gudelotti, eh, who knows, uh, he, wrote, and he, he wrote a blog post to sort of pimp his paid research. So you know Forrester. They, uh, they, will, they will do research, conduct market studies, do analysis on, on popular trends, and then they sell that to companies. Yeah, you want to mm-hmm. know how to uh, position yourself in the market for the next year? Buy our survey, and we'll tell, you, we'll tell you what's coming down the pipe, right? That's their pitch. And so they're yeah. supposed to be well-respected. That's debatable. But at the same time, they're never going to tell you, oh, there's nothing you need to do, you're fine. <laughs> well, and at the same time, it's also in their best interest to stir up controversy to sell these reports. More copies. So exactly. that's something to keep in mind. But here's what he said, and he started it. And this, remember, this is a blog post to tease his report. He started with, poor Linux. Poor Linux. It struggled so hard in the world. And he goes on to essentially say that with the adoption of mobile platforms, Android and iOS, Linux is dead. It's not going to take over the desktop because the desktop is dead. And he goes on to say, and just to put a little salt in the wound, the mobile platform space is extremely fluid, and I do not think the open source community can muster the forces necessary to compete. Open source never seems to be the innovator. Instead, it seems to disrupt 
pricing power for established technologies. So he's saying that open source right. is the biggest Linux never innovates. That's the giant ball of malarkey I've ever seen. It doesn't make any sense. It's like, sure it does, all the time. Well, dude, the entire internet runs off the innovations of open source technology. Exactly. The largest mobile platform out there, Android, runs mm -hmm. off of Linux. Now, yep. I think part of his argument is flawed right out of the well, gate. First, is he talking yeah, about Linux the kernel? That, or is he talking about, you know, I, mean, he's, I think he's a little confused right. as to what Linux is. Yes, and lots of people make that. But part of his main reasoning seems to be, oh, well, phones are popular, therefore the desktop is dead. It's like, well, the desktop's not going anywhere. Yeah. I, yeah. Sure, mobile devices are popular and people carry around an, I, a tablet of some kind, but that is never going to replace a desktop. Now, here's, here's where it got kicked up to another notch. ZDNet, always one to give the, give the clicks, like we've established a couple episodes mm -hmm, ago. Mm -hmm. They played off this Forrester research paper and, and published the year of the Linux desktop isn't coming. And what they used for this data was uh, web metrics from net market share. And I went and pulled my own stats, um, but I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Net market share, their job is to survey stuff and see what's popular. And he says, if you look from November 2009 all the way to October of 2011, Linux has progressed v very minorly. It, uh, very minor. It's at 2009, it's at 1.02%. Uh, and by October 2011, it's at 1.19%. Meanwhile, like the Mac OS has gone up and Windows has gone down. And he uses this as an argument to say, well, look, Linux is stagnant. It's not going anywhere. It's just idling. Um, of course, the, the BSD market share is even worse, Alan. It's like a 0 well, it's 0.01%. Well, nobody uses it for a desktop, right? Right, right. Um, but, you know, a lot of people use Linux for other things besides a desktop. So right. how do you quantify what the success of Linux is when by this article's own admission, Linux has a 60% server market share? So that's obviously yeah. some and success right there. And also, look at the embedded market share. Like, right. how, many people's, uh, some, you know, how many people have more Linux devices in their house uh, three times more Linux devices in their house than any other operating system or whatever, right? So he's got a few. He's got a few stats. You know, he your, shows your set your uh, your PBR, your TiVo, or yeah. even your custom one from your cable company that probably runs Linux. Your router that probably runs Linux. You know, uh, your cell phone. There's a good chance it runs. Oh, Linux. I know, man. I've been doing I've been doing runs Linux now for almost six years. I know. There's a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's embedded in everything. So, but I think know, the argument they're trying to make that. is it's it's unsuccessful on the desktop. It's 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 a it's a it's a lamb duck on the desktop. He's well, got another chart that shows the, that. Yeah, some people are trying to say it's, it's not successful on the desktop, although it's growing. And you know, the number of people I know that have switched to it is a lot higher than these stats are letting on. So I I wonder where exactly they base their stats on. Uh, and here's another thing he makes, and I think this actually shows the where I. I believe the flaw in the logic lies, and we'll get to that. But here, here's his kind of clo one of his closing paragraphs where he tries to drive it home. He says, um, the desktop portable operating system race is a one-horse race, Windows, and it seems to be set that way for the seeable future. Even Apple, which has enjoyed enormous success over the past few years, especially since transitioning to the Intel CPUs, he goes on to say, can only manage a very distant second place with the Mac OS. When you consider that Apple, with all of the resources that company has at its disposal, can only manage usage share measured in the single percentage points, it's pretty amazing, really. The Linux is only a few percentage points behind that. Um, and he goes on to yeah, say that, uh, you know, that war is lost. Microsoft dominates it, and now it's transitioned to and, a new you war. Know, Ap Apple isn't making huge piles of money off of that or anything. Oh, I know, right? They should, they should just give up and go away. That's what they should do. So, A, his <laughs> argument is if you don't have 90% of the market share, you're not competing, you're not winning, which is ridiculous because, you, you, as you just pointed out, Apple has 10% of the market share, and, and, and I, I believe I heard some sort of ridiculous stat, like Apple makes more money per one Mac than HP, Dell, and Acer combined make off a single sale of one of their PCs or mm -hmm. something. I mean, Apple's profit margins are ridiculous. So, A, yeah. Apple's proven the point that you don't have to have large market share to be profitable. But the thing that I think he goes on to say is that the other reason why Linux is dead is because this mobile space is invalidating the desktop. Yeah, now he's saying all desktops, even Windows desktops are dead. And that's the most ludicrous thing I have heard in a while. It's like, how do you plan to do most, like, you know, you can't really print something from your cell phone. 
right? You, you're not going to write a word. You doc can't write it and record. You can't edit, record, and, and stream live video from your Android phone like we're doing no. right here. Or, and even a tablet, you're not going to do serious video editing on a tablet, right? And you know, you can't sit down and write code on a tablet. But I think they're all work. right about one thing. Both the Forrester paper and this guy in ZDNet are touching on some. And there's there's been many other blog posts. I'm just I'm ignoring those other yeah. ones because they're all essentially say the same thing. What they're getting wrong is we really are transitioning to cloud-based, web-based applications. And that yeah. really, I mean, I can't believe how much is happening now. I read a stat that can, the general consumer, uh, of course, this was produced by uh, Amazon, so they're right. kind of, they kind of have some skin in the game. But Amazon yeah. released a study saying that the general consumer is more trusting of storing their data in the cloud than storing it on their own local hard drive because they believe it's more likely their hard drive could fail than the cloud will fail. So think about what that means. Think about, that's true, technically. No, well, I know, but I, Alan, I mean, I remember, or, or I remember failure, seven years comparing... ago, seven so years, five years ago, whatever it was, I was like one of the only people in my family buying stuff online. Now yeah. everyone buys like stuff from Amazon, all that yeah. kind. Of, it is truly moving to a cloud-based world. Right. That sort of, at that point, that's the big neutralizer, man. All you need right then and there is a good web browser like Firefox or Chrome. Yeah. And, and you so, don't need to pay three hundred dollars for a desktop. OS. Yeah. So if the desktop is actually dead, it's a good thing for Linux because it means everybody's desktop can be a Linux machine because they won't need the compatibility that Windows provides. Exactly. They'll just be a Linux box with a Firefox, and you point it at a website, and you go and you do your shit. Yeah. Exactly. And the the thing that I think people will will see over time is as the desktop becomes more irrelevant, Linux actually will have a better chance. And here's the reason I think. You could see a nexus of two events kind of happening more, around, more or less around the same time. When a new Windows OS comes out, it's kind of like a year and a half, two years before the general population adopts, you know, right away. New PC buyers get it. But think, right. about, think about Windows 8 and how much that Metro UI, how much change that is for, for what purpose? Yeah, like that, I, I really don't see myself using that. No, and and do, do you see businesses wanting a live start menu with tweets in there and your music library all live tiled no. you know the business which is the hugest deployment of windows out there aren't going to want that crap the other thing is the, microsoft in doing this is sort of create recreating a vista moment for linux now linux missed its opportunity last time with vista it i i think i think a lot of this maybe not clearly stated by these by these analysts i think a lot of this is linux had a shot vista sucked Vista was yep. slow, Vista required hardware upgrades, Vista was generally known to suck, and Linux didn't grab a head, didn't get ahead. Mm -hmm. That was because... It's in a much better position now with yes, companies we were still like, based on the open, app model like back Novell then. with uh, OpenSUSE and, and Ubuntu, with uh, Canonical with Ubuntu and so on. I think they're in a much better position to actually make a push now. Well, it's a much fairer uh, playing field. If you look mm -hmm. at the way Microsoft has been successful, they're a proven monopoly, uh, proven by a court, they abuse their monopoly position to coerce hardware manufacturers into shipping Windows, which then coerces software developers into creating applications for Windows, and that was a huge competitive advantage. Now people are creating applications on the web. That advantage is going away. They're making this UI change. It's not being well received. We could have another Vista moment at the same time that the application playing field is also leveling. Mm -hmm. That could be the breakthrough that Linux needs. Also, I wouldn't downplay the 60% market share it has on the servers. Because Not that means that's polish, that's refinement, that's scalability, that's stability, that's all of security, well, all of the things that make a great desktop, too. Yeah. And also, you know, if the cloud is going to grow, it's going to grow on top of Linux. It's not going to grow on top of Windows servers. Right. Right. Wouldn't right. it be interesting? Wouldn't it be like, uh, I don't think this would happen, but, you know, one of the big ways that Windows really took off for people at home was that's what they used at work. What, what if, you know, because of Windows 8, and more and more things being web-based, people adopt Linux at work, and it just starts filtering yep. into home. I think that's entirely possible. It, it could be that Linux is just very slowly being refined to get better and better. I mean, look what, well, look what Ubuntu wants to do. They want to get across devices. Look what OpenSUSE is doing with the build service and all this kind of stuff. Yep. It seems like Linux is not going to have this amazing breakthrough moment. What Linux is doing is sitting back, preparing itself, arming itself, and then waiting for the enemy to make its mistake. Yeah. Well, because at the same time, right, the, the main things that are held out to Windows are, you know, commercial apps and video games. 
video games for quite a while now have been moving more and more to the dedicated hardware of the gaming the console right like the uh, xbox or whatever yeah yeah gaming and, is a major weak spot for linux still but yeah you're right, right but but gaming on the pc is is weakening like the more and more games are coming out only for the console or the pc version is just a port of the console and it's not the other way around anymore yeah you're right about that i freaking hate that yes and and, and we see more and more apps even especially business apps moving into the cloud so that you can access them not just at work, right? And, you so know, you can but, access them on the go. Now, and, who knows? Who knows? But even look at yeah. OnLive, right? OnLive, I've used it. I've reviewed it. It literally is cloud-based gaming. It's not perfect, yep. but you can play first-person shooters on OnLive. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Now, I, I, went and got, I went to the same market research place that the ZDNet guy went to. I thought, let's go run the same charts and see if I come up with different data. So I did that. I'll have uh, This is on my Google Plus page. I don't know if I have a link in the show notes. But um, <laughs> if you actually look at the numbers, Starting from November 2009 to October of 2011, he cut it off. He cut it off. If you go to October of 2011, not a really big deal, but guess what you actually see? Linux is actually, Linux is the red line if you're watching the video version, and Android is the blue line. Linux is actually pulling ahead in this. Yep, that might be when he wrote his article, the October numbers weren't out yet. Well, it could be. I think he just wrote it a couple days ago. But my point is it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not stop. It had, the growth hasn't stopped. It's just right. a very, very slow organic growth, mm -hmm. which makes sense for an organically built operating system that is organically marketed through the user base, at least on the desktop end. This is actually, I think, kind of what we should expect. Yep. Especially if we're going to be poised to take advantage of the failure of Windows 8 and yep. cloud technology. Mm. And, yeah, I think at the same time that, you know, a lot of these usage numbers are very skewed by, you know, the type of websites that they're measured from and also whether they're measuring total traffic or unique traffic. Yeah. Because maybe a lot of it is just that Linux users waste less time online, right? When they go to websites, they get what they want and leave. They get it faster, yep. right? They, they, they're more, they're power users, so they, it takes them fewer steps to find what they're looking for. Yeah, I could I could believe that that'll play that play a bit into it. Um, also, how many uh, Linux users purposely mask their user agent to avoid stupid websites that say you can't use this because it's only for Windows or whatever? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and so I think that also masks part of the thing. And the other thing I think is the fragmentation. Uh, so many different versions of Linux reported differently that sometimes not all of them are counted as being Linux. Right. In, a lot of it ends up under other. There's like four percent that's other. So yeah. the, and how the, much of that is actually Linux that's just not being counted properly? Right, probably a lot actually. Yeah, because what else is it going to be? Well, and and there's just so many browsers. Yes. So, yeah, yeah, I I think uh, I think you're probably right there, Alan, too, as well. Uh, I had a few thoughts, uh, a few notes that I threw in the uh, show notes, and uh, I thought I would uh, leave those in there for you guys. I I, I threw this uh, question up on the Reddit. Subpage is asked, what do you guys think? Do you think that you know desktop Linux is uh, going away? Do you think it's dead? What do you think is going on? Of course, everybody had some great thoughts in there, so I threw some of those in the show notes if you want to read some of the uh, subreddit thoughts. I guess I, I would end with um, one other thought I had that I mentioned in the news segment was that vendor lock-in aspect where vendors sort of become reliant on their, on their ecosystem provider like Microsoft or Android and, uh, you know, Linux offers sort of a freedom for that where there's not all this stuff attached to it. You just, you, you can use it as a small, streamlined, customized, hardware-based little uh, device or a full-fledged desktop. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, think, I think what you're going to see here is things just aren't, Linux isn't just going to take over as fast as all of the media and maybe a lot of users want. I think a lot of people would like to see us by 2012 have Linux, you know, have an equal market share to the Mac or something like that. But it's just not going to happen until it's supposed to happen. In the meantime, yeah. We keep watching it, and I, I can tell you, things clearly have gotten better in the last six years. I mean, that is unquestionable. Oh, yeah. So For sure. At the current trajectory rate, Linux, Linux on the desktop doesn't have to be profitable to continue development, and, and that is its secret competitive advantage, right? Right. The moment WebOS, wasn't, uh, uh, the moment WebOS was not uh, competitive and, and revenue generating for HP, they killed it, right? Yeah. Uh, Google honestly would probably do the same thing if they discovered Android was a big uh, loss for them. Yeah, Apple, well, we've seen them kill lots of their services like Google, Buzz, and so on sure. and so on. And so, yeah, as soon as it's not viable, it goes away. Well, There's no Linux, board of directors, though, saying, you know, your bottom line needs to be shored up, so cancel this project. Desktop Linux will just continue to be developed as long as there's interest. Yeah, and, and it's just going to keep getting better. 
Exactly. It, it's it's going to just grow. It may, may grow slowly, but it's going to keep growing forever. It's not going to slacken off, I don't think. Right. And because it's not vendor controlled and vendor locked down, it can slowly over time evolve into what the world needs, not what Microsoft needs or Google needs. Exactly. And that is a more long-term competitive strategy. I mean, I'm not talking like five years long-term. I'm talking like 30 years long-term. Mm-hmm. So I think, I think at the end of it, as far as OSs that people load on their computer, Linux will probably, Linux and of course the BSDs and things like that will be one of the few remaining. I mean, do you guys yep. really think that these commercial products that Microsoft is selling today is really the same operating system we'll be using in 30 years? No. I mean, no. think about that. That's just not practical. No commercial company is going to do that. This is not going to happen. Um, so I think what it is, is a matter of perspective. I'd be curious though to hear your thoughts. Here's what we're going to do. Coming up soon, we've got, what, the Fedora review. I think then we've got an OpenSUSE review. But then I think it'll be about time we do a feedback episode to sort of cover the things from those reviews. And yep. I want to specifically hear your guys' thoughts on this topic. Is desktop Linux dead? If it's not, tell me why. If it is, you really better tell me why, because I'm going to read it on the show. So I, will, yep. I really want to hear some good arguments. Either way, leave them in the show notes or wherever you're watching this. You can over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, find season 19, episode 4, and leave a comment if you like. Or email me, Linux Action Show at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Both Alan and I will get those, and we will read them on a future feedback episode. I want to yep. know what you guys think. What do you, what do you say? Is it dead? Mm-hmm. Or is there a competitive reason why it's not dead that we just totally missed? There might be something we didn't even think about. Could be like the killer, killer reason why Linux is going to take off, and maybe we didn't think about it. So let us know. Alan, yep. any other thoughts? Uh, no. Not really. All right. Well, there you go. There's the Linux Action Show's word on desktop Linux. That is, it's sticking around, baby. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. I mm-hmm. hope you guys enjoyed that conversation. I, I wanted to kick it around to get your opinion on it, and I still want to hear what you think. So, like I said, leave us a comment. But now we tease it a little bit. Next week should be the Fedora 16 review, and if all goes as planned, we'll also be offering a VirtualBox download for that bad yep. boy. We've been, that's been pretty successful. Did you get any recent stats on how the uh, Shaka Raka Raka Bing Bang uh, uh, torrent did? The oh, you- uh, Chakra <laughs> download... Uh, my server alone seeded uh, 35 gigabytes. Nice, nice. Demos. Just from your, uh, just from your seed. Nice. Yeah, uh, and we got a lot of traffic off uh, right after the live show. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then more over the week. Yeah, and that a couple worked more out well. Like we had just, uh, a couple more downloads as late as last night. So that worked out well. Uh, right after the last wrapped up on the live stream, we gave the torrent out to the folks in the chat room so they could get yep. seeding it. Uh, you had like 50 seeders with like just in seconds and it just grew from there. It was, it was really awesome. Well, yeah, it's because uh, my server was seeding at 50 megabits per second. So <laughs> That'll do it. That, that, the 1,200 megabytes at 6 megabytes a second only takes a couple of minutes to finish. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and so, then once it's and out that, in the swarm, they... You well, know, exactly, because the, the whole point of the torrent is that the torrent gave a different piece to every different user and then they started swapping them between these. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, we had... 10 full copies of the file available before two people had finished downloading the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. And That's it was just awesome. a couple of minutes, and it went from there, and it worked very well. All right, and, well, we're, uh, we're wrapping up here. So uh, yep. there's, uh, there's two, probably two great ways to get a hold of either Alan and I. Alan, you're over at twitter.com slash Alan Jude. Yep. And you're also on Google+. Plus. I don't know. I, you know what? Link in the show notes for our Google Plus profiles. We're both on yep. Google+. Plus. I like Google+. Plus. I'm sorry. I, I do. like it. People are, yeah, and, it's a lot what? easier to follow a conversation. You got it, sir. You got it. Also, uh, I want to give a plug to the Jupiter Colony. The forum yep. needs some love. I have installed a new CAPTCHA. I don't know if okay. you saw that. I got a new CAPTCHA yep. on nice. there. Did some spam cleanup. So hopefully the forum's in better shape. So there's a link in the yep. show notes so you can go chat with the uh, colony members. Also, uh, a link to the network calendar so you can catch any of the shows we do live if you'd like to tune over to jblive.tv. This uh, show is recorded 10 a.m. Pacific on Sundays. Which, which is, is 1 p.m. Eastern and... Do you know what it is with the new time zone change? Uh, <laughs> UTC time zones don't change. Oh, okay. I thought, so, well, but your math changes because you got to convert it from your time, right? So let's see. Right. Sorry. So, well, um, 1800s is the chat room. You think yes, 1800. Yeah, yeah. 1800. Which is so, uh, UTC. 6 p.m. 6 UTC. p.m. Yeah. So if you uh, want to jo- Remember, if you're, if you're in Britain, the time will be not different anymore. God, that's confusing. You know what I do to make it easier is I just put a countdown on the live stream. If you tune in around before a show's supposed to be live, there'll be a counter to let you know how long until that show kicks off. So also, that way you don't have to worry about yeah, it. Yeah, the Google Calendar you have at uh, Jupiter Broadcasting 
dot com uh, allows you to set what time zone you're in, and yep. then the show times show up on the calendar in your time. Yeah, which makes it much easier to figure yeah. out. And I also have a link to a time zone converter at the bottom yep. of the page too, so you can just keep that handy if you want. Yeah. All right, everyone, go check out one of those RSS feeds. Grab the show weekly, and we'll see you right back here next week.